Welcome back. In this lesson, I'll talk about laptop display types and their associated components. As usual, I'll try to show as much hands-on as possible. Here we'll cover the different types of laptop displays, display functionality, inverters, digitizers and touchscreens, and webcams and microphones. Without the display, a user can't accomplish anything on the computer. So it's crucial to understand the technology and vital to select quality displays when considering new laptops or screen replacements. There are several things you should be able to do at the end of this lesson. One, understand how to disassemble laptop displays from prying out the screen bezel to the screws to the connectivity from the display to the main body of the laptop and then reassembling everything again safely and securely. Two, know how to make changes to the display, including the brightness, screen mirroring or screen extending, resolution changes, and so forth. Three, be able to describe what an inverter does and why we don't see them as often as we did, say, a decade ago. Four, explain what a touchscreen and digitizer are. And lastly, five, know how to replace a webcam and how to test a newly installed one. At the end of the lesson, I'll close up the laptop I've been working on. And remember, always document everything you do when disassembling and reassembling computers. That's it for the introduction. Onward. Let's discuss the types of laptop displays and technologies you should know for the A-plus exams. The liquid crystal display, or LCD, is the main type of display used by laptops. The difference is how they are lit, which I'll return to in a moment. Now, LCDs have two sheets of polarizing material which is used in thin film transistor, or TFT, displays. These are often active matrix. By active matrix, I mean that they have multiple transistors within each pixel. These are low-energy devices compared to the much older cathode ray tube displays, or CRT displays, which, by the way, you might still see in some labs. However, these LCDs still use more energy and are less efficient than newer displays that use LED or OLED backlighting. It's the backlighting differences that you really need to know for the exam. LCDs originally used a lamp and inverter to light up the display. Overwhelmingly, this lamp was a cold cathode fluorescent lamp, or CCFL, and it would be somewhere on the bottom of the display here. These generally require AC power. Because the laptop runs internally on DC power, we need an inverter to change the power from DC to AC to power the lamp. And that inverter would usually be somewhere in here on the display, perhaps in the computer, in the main body here. It's an extra step that creates two potential points of failure, that lamp and that inverter. It's also not the most efficient way of doing things because normally with a laptop, we are converting from AC to DC at the power brick and then inverting from DC to AC inside the laptop. So today we have other lighting sources. And the first is LED, which stands for light emitting diode. These are also referred to as LED LCDs which might sound confusing at first, but remember that it is the same type of display that we have here, just with different backlighting. 
And I say just, but really it is a big deal. First, everyone knows how energy efficient LEDs are. If you've ever replaced an incandescent light bulb in your house with an LED, you can measure the difference in electricity used. Typically, it's a fraction of incandescent and fluorescent bulbs. So the same efficiency applies to LED backlit displays. The RGB diodes, the red, green, and blue diodes, are very small and quite capable. And secondly, they don't require AC power. They run off of DC, which means that they don't need an inverter. And in general, they use less power, which conserves the laptop's battery. As of the recording of this video, these are the most common type of display and backlighting. In a minute, I'll disassemble a laptop's LED display just to show it a little bit. A derivative of LED is organic LED, or OLED. OLEDs use different material that can be printed onto, and you can print, quote-unquote, this material onto just about anything. And they can be incredibly small. As of the recording of this video, OLEDs offer the best black levels, but you might want to go with straight LED if you're more interested in brightness and possibly viewing angle. Let's take a look at an LED display, also known as an LED LCD now. Okay, so here we have a laptop. And basically, to get the display out of here, to get the actual display out, we have two screws on the bottom. There's one here and one here, and they're covered with caps. I've already removed the cap on one, and so I'll remove the cap on the other one here. And let's zoom in a little bit. And you want to use the right tool for this, and here we have a tool. This is a metal prying tool. You want it to have a thin end and it has to be strong, but it has to be kind of pointy as well so you can get in there to get access to that cap and get that cap out. You don't want to damage these if at all possible or damage the bezel. So you want to kind of pry these out with one of these tools. There we go. One shot and no damage. Should be good. Place that aside. That's just a sticky cap. You can always get new ones if you need to. And then we can just unscrew those two screws. And I'm using my trusty number one Phillips head screwdriver. Now, if you're ever wondering, uh, you can see the number one here. So trusty number one Phillips head screwdriver. And we'll get the other other guy here I already took the cap off and that's the first step got to get those caps and the screws off of there okay and at this point I might expose some circuitry so we want to make sure that we have our ESD protection in place I'm gonna zoom out a little bit here okay and you want to have a good assortment of tools with you as far as uh, prying tools with flat ends, pointy ends, uh, plastic, metal, as I mentioned. Um, and one of the tools I like is something a little bit wider for this job. Pretty thin, pretty wide, pretty strong, but a little bit flexible so that we can pry this uh, monitor out. Sometimes what I like to do is I like to cover the monitor display with paper or something else so as not to scratch it because you want to be really careful when you go in here you want to put your shim in there and just gently get underneath and start prying out okay and you might want to use two shims and you want to carefully start removing this okay so you might hear a little bit of a crack there as you're prying this out and we want to do that all the way around just try not to actually press against the screen itself 
And when you get up to this area, you want to be careful because uh, you have your webcam and microphones here. So you want to be sure to pry around those and be real careful with that. Once it starts coming out, you can use your fingers to help pop it out of its connectors. And there's several other tools we can use with this. Again, you just want to be careful as you're going around. And I, I actually pause the video. I like to go around and shim slowly all the way around a couple times and slowly remove it so that we don't bend or damage the bezel or the display. And if it doesn't go, we don't want to force it. So we'll just slowly work it. Slowly working on that bezel so we don't damage it. Almost there. And the last one is where you can definitely do damage sometimes. There we go. And we got it off and it actually looks fairly clean. Another place to watch uh, to be careful is here at the hinges. Um, you want to make sure you don't crack anything or damage anything. So this looks pretty good actually. Put that to the side. And then we have access to our display. And generally you have a couple screws holding that in. One, two, three, and four. Then we have additional screws here for the chassis for the display. And you'll notice some uh, power here. We have a power cable that leads to the connector for the display. And we have another power cable and control cable for our webcam assembly, which goes all the way down this way. So sometimes you might need to replace these as well. And if you put in a new display, it may or may not come with this cable. So you may have to get that separate if you need a new one. So the next step is to unscrew that. Now the trusty number one Phillips head screwdriver is usually good enough. But uh, you probably want to have some uh, mini screwdrivers available to you. Uh, much smaller screwdrivers for working on laptops. So that's uh, something you probably want to have in your tool kit. And really, mobile device kits are pretty easy to get your hands on and are fairly inexpensive. And so that's definitely a good idea. And it's also a good idea to have some type of cloth that you can put the screen on when you take it out. Okay, so you want to have something put down to protect that so we don't scratch it. And basically it just lifts out. And I like to lift it out and pull down. Now at this point, you want to be real careful with the connector that's here. Okay, so when we take in the connector out, we quite often will have a piece of tape here, and we'll have to remove that. And one of your really thin pieces of shim can help to get some of that tape off. Don't want to press too hard on the monitor, but we're going to want to pull that tape and label, because that's actually connected to that connector. It's kind of protecting it. Okay, and that exposes the connector, and then we can pull that connector out. Pull it out evenly. Okay, put that to the side, and then we can take our display and remove that. Because you never know, maybe the display is actually working. Uh, if you're removing the display, you should have troubleshot a lot of other things first. Um, but just be ready to, just be careful with it, just in case, because you never know. And hold it by the edges. Okay, this is a test computer, so I'm not really too worried about it. But the new display we'd place down on a material like this. And then plug it back in and put everything back together. Okay, so this is an LED-based LCD. Uh, 
So again, it's an LCD display, but it uses LED. It uses diodes. So very efficient. And then in addition to that, we don't have an inverter to worry about. We don't have that CCFL backlight that can go bad. If anything's going to go bad, it's either going to be the connector, which can happen, or the display itself needs to be replaced. That's about it when it comes to these LED screens. So we can connect this guy back in and just connect it all in one shot. Make sure that there's no copper connectors showing. Tape it back down. Carefully place the screen back in position. Line up the screw holes. Make sure that the power cable for this, the display cable, is run properly in its channel. Because once we put the bezel on, we don't want anything to get damaged. Okay, then we can screw that guy back in with our four screws. Always keep your screws in some type of cup, baby food jar, something to keep those handy and keep them separated. You might want to have uh, several jars set aside that are labeled for different types of screws. Write it out, document, because sometimes all these screws, it can get a little bit uh, confusing, which is which. But this is a fairly simple uh, change out. And then finally, we would put the bezel back on and snap it back in uh, one piece at a time. When I talk about the webcam, a little bit in a separate video. Uh, once I show that, then we'll put the bezel back on uh, permanently. So there's a little bit of uh, display removal and how you go about doing that with a typical LED based LCD display. And again, the main things here are to really watch for the cable that's in the hinge here, how it's routed, and that connector. Want to make sure that you're very careful with that connector. It's very easy to damage those very thin connector when you reconnect those. And it's all about the tools, you know, the right prying tools uh, for the job. And that these are the two main tools that I used. And you'll note that there wasn't a mark on the caps or the display or the bezel. And that's what we want. So that's about it for this lesson. Make sure you know the difference between regular old LCDs that use the backlight and an inverter and LCDs like the one that we have here that are LED based and also the difference between those and OLED or OLED. So that's it for this video. Okay, let's talk about display functionality. I've got the laptop here and I have a secondary monitor connected to this guy. Now, when it comes to laptops, the display functionality is changed from your function keys and from Windows or from the operating system you're using. So for example, as we mentioned in a previous sub lesson, you can change the brightness of your laptop screen by using the function key and in this laptop, it's F2 or F3 to decrease or increase that brightness. Now, if you have a secondary monitor, that's going to be on the on-screen display with the controls here. But otherwise, these work the same way as your desktop counterparts. And you modify how the screen looks in the same places. Now, I'll give an example of this and we'll show the secondary monitor as well. And I connected the secondary monitor from the laptop, from the HDMI port. That's a full-size HDMI, so it's just using a regular HDMI cable out to that monitor. This is running Windows 8, and it picked up the monitor automatically, but you may have to configure this. And so to do so, you'd use the monitor toggle key, this guy here. And on many laptops, that's F4, 
So we press the function key and press F4, and you have different options here. You could use the laptop screen only, and we could tap on that with the mouse, or we could just arrow over to it if we wanted to. And when we do so, you only get the display on here. And now it's, uh, it's showing the browser window that was open on this screen. And so everything's gonna get condensed onto just the laptop and the monitor will go into sleep mode. And you can see that sleep mode because you see the amber light here. Amber means sleeping, green means on. And by the way, if I haven't mentioned this before, a uh, great website, uh, grc.com, uh, the SpinWrite program as a PC tech, you should have that, get that program. Shields Up is also awesome. So that's just a side note. But if we want to get the screen back, we'll press function key and F4 again. We have additional options. Now you could just use the laptop screen or you could just use the second screen if you wanted to and save this screen altogether. And you could also configure it so the laptop could be closed, but you could still work with it with an external uh, mouse and keyboard. And now if we press the function key and F4, that op those options show up on the secondary screen. You have another option, you can duplicate the screen, have the same thing on both displays. So that's a nice feature as well. If you're doing presentations or what have you, and you're exporting the video signal out to a secondary monitor, a big TV or a projector, you may wanna do that so you can do your PowerPoint presentations or whatever, and it'll show up on that secondary screen. And the one that I use the most often is extend. The extend feature allows you to extend the desktop across the laptop and to the secondary screen. So that's the one I want. And that's what you'll see quite often. This way, someone can work on one window on one screen, you know, perhaps a browser window, and then have another window open here, like Microsoft Word documents, or here you can see I have a uh, file explorer open, which by the way shows, uh, I'm showing hidden files and folders like boot manager and hyperfill.sys and pagefile.sys. So that's uh, something you wanna check. If someone's trying to do a presentation or someone's trying to watch something on a secondary monitor, you gotta check that monitor toggle key. And again, you gotta press the function key and F4 at the same time, because if you press just the F4 key or whatever key it might be, you'll get the drop down menu for the particular window that you're in, which is a nice feature by the way, but that's not what we want. So we press function and F4 and we get that those options here. And you can get to this from the charms bar and from, uh, you know, a couple different other places in Windows 8. Uh, so that's up to you how you get to it. On a laptop, for me, it's just so easy to use a shortcut like Function and F4. Now, once you get this all set up, and oh, by the way, Windows 8 remembers your configurations. So if you were to disconnect this monitor and then later reconnect it, it will remember how that monitor was connected. It will remember that it was connected in extend mode or whatever mode you had it in it'll remember that which is nice it's almost like a hardware profile windows 8 will remember that for you once you have it all set up and you are displaying to the other screen you're going to want to make sure that the resolutions are correct on both uh, i just pressed windows d to minimize all windows and what we want to go to is the screen resolution uh, window so we'll right click anywhere on the desktop and select screen resolution. So we can see here we have the two windows. It's showing each monitor that's connected. You might have more monitors if you're working with a PC, but on a laptop, generally you just have one output. It's usually HDMI, or if you have a, uh, a MacBook, it'll be that display port that uses Thunderbolt. Um, you might also see DVI on older laptops as the, ex as the external connection, but HDMI will be the standard. And you can see whatever screens are connected. So the primary screen, number one, is normally the laptop, though you can change that. And you can see it says here, mobile PC display, and the resolution is 1920 by 1080. So that's 1080p, that is high definition. It's meant for watching video and what have you. Now, if we tap on the second screen, you'll see it shows it's an Asus VS247, 
And I got that specifically because it's meant to be used as an HDMI uh, device and it works great for watching video. And so that's also 1920 by 1080 and that's the recommended resolutions for both, but we can change those. We can reduce that if we want. Let's say if we watch a lot of YouTube videos that run at 720p, we could change that and you could see that it changes the size of that monitor on the screen. So it gives you an idea of what the difference will be between the resolutions. Maybe your laptop screen isn't that big. Maybe it's only 13, 14 inches and you want to have that at a, high, at a lower resolution so the icons show up bigger and you can do that. We could change this guy to 1280 by 720 and maybe have the secondary screen set to the maximum recommended. Then we apply that and everything on this screen will actually show up bigger. We can keep those changes. It won't be as clear on this screen, but you might want to watch videos at 720p on here and then have a lot more clear information here. Uh, generally, I keep the laptop at 1920 by 1080 also. Now that is a, that 1920 by 1080, that is a 16 by 9 aspect ratio, 16, 9 aspect ratio. You might also see 16, 10 aspect ratios on some laptops, and that's 1920 by 1200. That's more common on a desktop PC, especially if you're going to do editing. But if you're dealing with multimedia and laptops, quite often 1920 by 1080 or 1080p is the standard. And you can also change how the secondary monitors work from here, just like we did from that side option before. That's another place to do that. So you can really get into how these are uh, set up. You can also modify which goes where. Let's say you wanted to have, let's say you wanted to have this monitor on the left of the laptop. Well, we could just drag that physically over here. And then that would situate it that way. So when you move the mouse, it would cross over from this desktop to the other one over here. So that's however you would like it. You can adjust those however you want. And this is known as a multiple monitor display at this point. Very common in uh, because the laptop screens are just so small. You can change the resolution on the laptop screen. You can change the font size. Uh, you can change the DPI and all that. But still, if you have a 12 or 13 or 14 inch screen, it, it's just that. It's a small screen. So that secondary monitor works really good. So there's a little bit about uh, display functionality. Remember your uh, function keys, your brightness option, and your monitor toggle option here. Remember both of those and know how to get to the screen resolution option as well, where you can change how the multiple displays work, change where they're oriented, and change the resolution. Let's talk about the inverter in a laptop. A power inverter is an electronic device that changes direct current or DC into alternating current AC. It then feeds that power to the lamp of an LCD. The inverter itself does not create power. It merely transforms it into a type of power that the LCD can use. But this is only in the case of an LCD that is backlit by a lamp, usually a CCFL. It's not necessary in today's LED and OLED displays, even if those displays are LCD based, which they usually are. So we don't have to deal with inverters as much anymore, but you need to know the concept for the exam. Any additional part in a laptop creates a potential point of failure. Being a circuit board that transforms energy, this inverter can be prone to failure. 
So here we have an older Dell laptop with an LCD screen that is lit by a CCFL, which is behind here. On the bottom here, on the bottom of the display, we see the inverter section, which is covered with a metal plate. The inverter could be in other locations though. It could be on the side here. You know, it could actually even be inside the uh, main system, but usually it's in this type of location uh, just below the display. Now we might determine that the inverter has failed because there's nothing on the display and we've already checked the screen itself, the lamp and the video card. If those all check out okay, then it could be that the inverter has to be replaced. So here we have an example of an inverter board, and this is something you would use for this actual laptop. And so what you have here is a connector. And so your power connector goes in here and connects here. And then you have the actual inverter circuit that transforms from DC to AC. So you want to be careful with this um, before you actually start working on this type of job. You have to keep in mind that an inverter can hold a charge. So you want to do a couple things. First of all, you want to power down the laptop, disconnect the battery, and then it's a good idea to press and hold the power button for 30 seconds to discharge the motherboard. Make sure everything is completely discharged and have your uh, anti-static strap on make sure you have that esd prevention going then basically there's a screw to remove here take the plate off and this usually lifts out now you have to disconnect the uh, power connector here pull straight out but you want to make sure that you hold this inverter board by the edges you don't want to touch any of the circuitry or the inverter itself make sure that you are you know grounded and be very careful when handling this and then place that inside of an anti-static bag uh, when you're done uh, when you're done handling it and when you put the new one in do the same thing make sure you hold it by the edges uh, and again be careful with these especially when removing them because they can hold a charge and then you put the connector on the power connector here make sure that your wires are not getting crimped in any way make sure they're routed properly and then screw it back on now power inverters in laptops are less common today because they are not necessary in most cases laptops incorporate more efficient and simpler designs Many still use the LCD, the liquid crystal display, as the actual display or screen, but the backlighting is different. Instead of using a high-powered CCFL that's back here and an inverter, many screens today use diodes. They use LEDs or OLEDs for the most part. These rely on DC power, and so there's no inversion required. So today's, you know, today's screens, they simplify the process and they remove a point of failure, which can reduce the amount of repair time required by a technician. Plus it increases battery life compared to an LCD that uses a lamp. So that's the inverter it changes power from DC to AC. Another example of an inverter is a conversion device that you might use in your car that changes the DC power that comes out of the power outlet and changes that into AC power. And you can see AC ports here for use with whatever it is you're working with, electronic devices or whatever that requires AC power. So you plug this into your power outlet and then this takes care of that conversion, that inversion into AC power. And in some cases, devices have connectors that you can connect directly with one of these into the power outlet without having to do any inversion if it's a, a DC based device. So, but that's just another example of an inverter. You know, you could plug a television or a toaster into this if you wanted to, as long as it doesn't go past 120 Watts max. So it's important to know the differences also between an inverter and a rectifier. 
Here we have a standard laptop AC adapter. It acts as a rectifier and not an inverter. Essentially, rectifiers perform the reverse function of an inverter. Rectifiers take AC power. You know, this is a standard brick for your laptop, a standard AC adapter. So you plug in the AC cable into your AC outlet, and it takes that and converts that into DC power, goes through here, and changes it over to DC power here, goes in here, and this goes into your DC in jack in the laptop because the laptop uses DC power internally. But the AC adapter is more than that. It consists of a transformer, a rectifier, and an electronic filter. The transformer takes the higher voltage and converts that to a lower voltage. The rectifier converts from AC to DC, and then the electronic filter can be used to filter out noise and unwanted signal. So you want to make sure that this is the right transformer. It's the right AC adapter and that it will uh, reduce to the correct voltage that your laptop needs. But remember, an inverter changes power from DC to AC. So it takes the direct current, which flows in one direction only, and changes that to alternating current, which periodically reverses direction. Lamps such as CCFLs require this multi-directional flow of electricity, and therefore they rely on AC. So to sum it up, rectifiers change from AC to DC, and inverters, these change from DC to AC. And the inverter board that we see here is something that helps to power that lamp for older LCD designs. And that's it for this video. Let's briefly discuss touchscreens. Touchscreens and digitizers enable a user to tap or write on the screen. It can be done by tapping with a finger or using a stylus. These touchscreens are commonly found in smartphones, tablets, Chromebooks, and some laptops. Laptops that incorporate touchscreens are not only output devices, but are also input devices, which in some cases requires a separate connector. Not all laptops have touchscreens, though, and those that have them may suffer from lower resolution than other mobile devices, such as smartphones and tablets, making them less accurate. The digitizer is often separate. More accurately, the digitizer is a device that converts tapped or written impulses on the screen, those analog impulses that we tap on there, and it converts those into instructions that are digital for the operating system to follow. It's often an overlay for an LCD screen, but that will depend on the device. The better the resolution and the better the digitizer, the better the overall experience will be for the user. And touchscreen functionality can be added to a laptop if it doesn't have it in a variety of ways. One, we can install a replacement screen and or digitizer. And if you have an older laptop, you probably won't be able to do an all-in-one screen, but it could be that someone purchased a laptop but they didn't go for the touchscreen capability, though it was available on that model. So you could always upgrade that screen. So in some cases, it's possible to get a replacement screen and digitizer. Or we could install an overlay on top of the device, which either connects internally or could possibly be USB-based. Or we could install a magnetic bar on the bottom that allows for touchscreen uh, capability. And these are usually USB based as well. So let's take a look at a couple of the devices that use touchscreens. Okay, and you can see here I have several devices. And so here we have an iPad and standard touchscreen for that. It's all built in. You've got your display with the touchscreen overlay. It's all one piece and we can move about 
just by tapping on the screen. All right. Over here, we have a smartphone, which you'd use for tapping. And this is normal. Everybody, Just about everybody uses these. And then here we have a Chromebook. And Chromebooks and laptops might have touch screens as well. Now, I had shown opening a uh, laptop display previously. And we had used a tool, a shim tool, to do that. Now, that's good for many laptops. But for devices like these like Chromebooks and for uh, iPads and other tablets and also smartphones, uh, you're going to want to pry open these a little bit differently because uh, it's such a thin area that you're working with. So one of the tools I use a lot is called a spudger. Some people call it a spludger. And uh, there's plastic versions, but the metal versions are usually what you want. Very thin end. And I actually use this for a lot of different things um, to get the tabs off of the uh, top of the screws we showed using this. And uh, it's good to have a kit of these different sizes that you can use to help separate the uh, display or open up one of these devices. So that's uh, definitely a tool you want to have or a set of these in your kit. And I use these all the time. Now, touchscreen functionality can be kind of funny. Um, sometimes if you're working, and you're working, say, in a uh, web page, you know, we can use a mouse, which I'm using now, and we can use the touchpad as well to go about between different things here. Uh, but sometimes you'll notice that clicking on these items with, say, the touchpad or with the mouse doesn't work. You actually have to do it with uh, tapping on the screen in order to actually bring those down, to bring down that menu. And uh, so sometimes you actually have to touch. And there's sometimes there's settings you can change to uh, modify this. And it all depends on how the website is uh, configured as well. And let's show this uh, close up. What I was doing here was I was using the mouse to take a look at these menu options on my website. But by hovering, it doesn't do anything. They, the menu doesn't come down. And by clicking, nothing happens as well. We have to actually tap on it to get that menu to actually come down here for these different menus. And I'm tapping on the screen right now to get that menu information. So, you know, it, it may work a little bit differently with Chromebooks or laptops or tablets. It all depends on what you're using. Uh, so you have to be ready to use a combination of the keyboard, the mouse, the touchpad, and either a, a uh, you know tapping on the screen or using some type of stylus. And so, for example, here this uh, smartphone has a stylus built in on the bottom, and you can pull that out, and you can use that, use that on your screen. You can use it on other screens as well. Now, this may or may not work because the digitizer may be designed more for a finger where it's capacitive, or you may be able to use a stylus as well. Depends on the device. Okay. And so we can also add, as we mentioned, we can add touchscreens to laptops as well. But if you look at this particular laptop, we'll see here. You know, all we had was that one connector. We dis we removed this display in a different video, and all we had was that one connector. And that connector does not allow, on this laptop, it does not allow for touchscreen capability. Uh, some similar laptops to this around the same age do allow for it, but it doesn't look like anyone offers one for this. And it's really because of the circuitry inside there. But... Basically, what you could do is with laptops is you could either remove the entire LCD and put in a combo kit, an LCD, and a um, as well as a, a digitizer overlay, or you could just leave this screen and put on a digitizer overlay if it fits under the bezel and if you have the connectivity for it. So in some cases, you can add that on. But many more laptops are coming with that touch screen ability. 
where you can actually touch on the screen, do everything you'd need to do on that guy. And, you know, you have laptops and also Chromebooks that can be used as a laptop, or you can flip them over and use them just as a tablet, or you can fold them in a V, that kind of thing. So there's lots of options there. So keep in mind here that uh, you can install replacement screens or digitizers uh, on these, especially as overlays within your devices. And if you're called upon to do so, you'll have to do the same type of thing we did when we removed the display. You'll have to remove the bezel or take the display apart. And then if you're doing a digitizer overlay, you can put that in as long as it's compatible. If you have to, you remove the entire screen and remove those four screws, the entire display, and put a new display and digitizer in there. So you have to be careful whenever you're working on these types of things. Make sure that you're safe and uh, employing ESD uh, prevention and uh, work in a safe environment, and everything should go smoothly. So that's about it for this video. Hey, let's briefly discuss webcams and microphones. I'm working on a laptop that I've been working on through some of these videos, and I do have it opened up, so you wanna make sure you have your anti-static uh, protection, uh, your ESD protection. And in a previous video, I took off the bezel here, and underneath the bezel, you'll find the webcam, which has the built-in microphones. And so here's the actual uh, camera. And then this one I think has two microphones, one here and one here, so stereo microphones. And it's on a very small circuit board, which plugs in right here. So when you're troubleshooting a webcam and it's not working and you don't think it's a software problem, then you could open it up and take a look and see if it's connected. Usually these connectors don't come loose, but you never know what the case may be, especially if you're doing repairs. So may need to uh, plug this guy back in. Okay, uh, but this is connected right now. And you can see the wire is actually routed all the way down here and through here and underneath. And by the way, you might also notice, uh, I don't know if you can read this, but this says CA main and CA aux. These are the antenna leads that came from our M.2 card our Wi-Fi slash Bluetooth card, which routes all the way underneath here. The card is somewhere, somewhere in this area here underneath. Um, and it routes through here, through the hinge, up here and around and up to here to uh, you know, get us some length on those antennas to try and you know, keep the antenna on the top of the display so we can get better uh, access. That's the way you wanna route those, if at all possible. But uh, we're talking about the webcam here. And if you ever need to replace a webcam, or perhaps for security purposes, remove the webcam, you'll have to get that bezel off, and then you'll have to uh, remove the screen, the display. I've already unscrewed the four screws for this. So we can just lift that out carefully. Place that down on a soft surface. Uh, dry, lint-free cloth. Right now I'm using a paper towel, but that's whatever. This is my test laptop. A dry, lint-free cloth would be the best if you have it. And then you'll see here, now we have this connector. And sometimes these connectors can be a little bit tough to get out. It's this white connector comes out here. And sometimes you'll have to pry it. And you might have to pry it from both sides with some type of prying tool. And loosen it out a little bit. There we go until you can get it out. Now I just use metal and that's kind of a no-no. It's better to use plastic if at all possible because we do have a circuit board here. But always remember before working on the laptop, always uh, you know, power it down, take the battery out, discharge with the power button, use the SD protection and so on. Uh, so you can minimize the risk of damaging anything here. But just be careful taking that connector out because they could be kind of flimsy sometimes, those little connectors. And again, if you know, sometimes this might get a little bit loose, so that's something you can just uh, reseat in there and see if it works. Now, if you need to replace this, uh, in some cases, 
uh, once in a while you'll see these screwed in, but generally you won't. Sometimes they'll just lift right out, and sometimes they'll be taped on, and that's the case here. This one's actually taped in there. It's got sticky tape under here, and if you wanted to replace it, you'd have to remove all this tape, which goes all the way underneath, and then pull the whole unit out. I'm not going to replace that right now. But that's how you do it. And if you got a replacement unit, you'd need to make sure it comes with some type of tape so it'll stay in place. Uh, you could lay it in there and hope that it stays and hope that the bezel keeps it in there. But the, uh, the two-sided tape can be very helpful, and they designed this specifically for the webcam. So you'd have to remove this tape. It goes all the way underneath. Take the whole unit out and take the new tape and assembly and webcam. Put that in carefully. And uh, what, what I like to do is I like to mark it, uh, mark it with a pencil or something to, so I know exactly where that tape was and where that webcam was supposed to go. So removal is pretty easy and once you get that tape off, uh, if you do have to remove it or if you have to take it out for security purposes. Then get that tape flattened in there, put the display back on, put the bezel back on, and you'll be in business. Just make sure that you, of course, connect that power cable back in there, that signal cable. Because this takes care of the webcam and the audio. And when you reconnect these, sometimes they don't go in all the way on the first shot. So you have to make sure they are uh, tight in there. I'm just using a little opening tool to press that in there more. Make sure that connection is good. And I mean, that's pretty much it. You know, I think everybody that's watching this understands what a webcam does and why we use it. We use it for communication purposes or for recording purposes. And uh, a lot of laptops come with webcams that can record as much as 720p, perhaps higher. And again, have those uh, stereo microphones so you can get some decent audio. Now, a couple things you want to check for, and I have my other similar laptop running whenever you are working with a webcam. If you install a new one, you want to try to use the uh, the right type, first of all. But then once you install it, you want to check in your device manager and check the cameras section and make sure that it sees it as what it's supposed to be. And if it shows up in the other devices section or something like that, you want to make sure to install the driver for it. So for this one, it's Shiba Web Camera and HD. Okay, and then you can test that by going to the uh, built-in Windows 10 camera app. And if you bring that up, it should automatically run that camera and this is running at 720p right here and you just see a bunch of my gear you can take pictures you can record um, you can use this for communication you can use it for webinars or for skype or facetime or whatever so you have a lot of options here um, so this webcam is working properly on this other system and we've tested that very basically with the camera app now, as I mentioned, the webcam also has uh, the microphones. And in some cases, you may have uh, some, um, you may not want to use those. You may want to use another microphone, say one that you plugged in through USB or something like that, like a Rode Podcaster or something like that. So you can modify what microphone you're using. And you can do that in a control panel. Now, right now, I'm in category view. I like to go to uh, large or small icons, and uh, you want to go to the sound option. If you're in category view, then you go to hardware and sound and dig down from there. But uh, the exam and really in the field, they both want you to know, uh, you really want to know the icons mode as well. So you can go directly to what you want. So in this case, it'd be sound. I'll bring that up. That brings up the sound dialog box. And you can modify the playback options, meaning what's, uh, what speakers you'll be using. 
By default, we're just using the built-in Harman Kardon speakers, but you can also modify the recording, and in this case, the microphone. So here we have the built-in microphone for the webcam, and there's two of them, two high-definition audio microphones. But again, it could be that you have something plugged in to USB. So you'd have to select that from this list and set that as the default device. And then that would be checkmarked. So you just want to check that. And you can see as I'm talking, the uh, levels are showing up. So we know that our audio is working. So this is a good way to test whether your webcam's microphones are actually functioning. So after you do any install, if you do a replacement or an install of a new webcam and microphones, then you're going to gonna want to go in there and check that. Check it in the device manager, check it with the camera app, and check it with the sound properties. All right, so at this point, what I'm going to do, uh, because I don't think I'm going to be working inside the laptop anymore, I'm going to put this laptop back together and we'll install. Actually, I already have Linux on here. I think I'm going to install the latest version of Ubuntu Linux and see how it runs in comparison to uh, Windows 10 that we had running very sluggishly on it before. So to do that, we want to you know, take a look here, make sure that everything's connected properly. We want to make sure that our wires are routed properly, our webcam is connected. This one's actually coming loose from the tape a little bit, but I think the uh, bezel will hold that down once we get it in. Okay, we'll put our display back on here and lay that in place. There we go. And this has four screws. And one goes here. Screws into the chassis inside of the display top here and i'll put the rest of those screws in okay that's two and yeah, we get the other two in then we'll do the bezel Now we're going to start snapping the bezel back in. I like to start with the hinges. Get them snapped in. You can probably hear that. And you want to get a corner going first. Once you get that primary snap, then you can start snapping down the way to get the rest of it in place. And that's the important part right there. We want to make sure that the webcam See a little damage to the uh, plastic cover over the webcam. That might have to come out. But I uh, want to make sure that this stays in place and that the webcam is, the actual camera is light right there. If it's not in line perfectly, then the microphones will be covered up. So that's another issue with that. So it becomes very important when you uh, change one out, which isn't that often. But so we'll keep working around. Each snap along the way. Sometimes you have to kind of compress it a little bit to get it snapped into place. Okay, and so it's snapped in. For the most part, it looks like we have a little gap right here. There it goes. So we're going to make sure there's no gaps. And at one point, somewhere in the bezel, it's going to compress and it's going to look like it's bending a little bit. It's, there's going to be some curvature there, but that's normal. You have to just get it all snapped into place. And you want to make sure the uh, hinge covers are snapped into place also. And then test it, close it, reopen, make sure it opens okay. And we should be in good shape. Okay, and then we need to put our two screws back in, and there's one on each side. Okay, so we'll screw that in. And the other one. And when you're doing repairs, 
you know, if you work on a bench, you'll probably have lots of these screw covers, these little tabs. Um, if not, you can order them and place those back in. That one's slightly damaged, actually. I don't know if I did that today or another day, but this one's pretty nice. Um, so I'll, I'll probably swap that out later. And place those covers back in just so it looks nice. But I like to put new ones on. Uh, I don't quite know where my new ones are. I have a bunch of them for Toshiba. But uh, put some new ones on every time you do some work so it looks nice. Okay. And so we have our bezel back on here. And everything looks good. We'll close that up. And we had the bottom cover off as well because we were showing all kinds of stuff inside of here. This is the non-upgraded laptop. The other one I was working on, I upgraded the RAM and the hard drive and so on, which you never know, I might do with this as well, just get a cheap SSD somewhere just to make it run faster. But uh, we'll put that back on and there's a whole ton of screws to reconnect all this. This kind of does a lot of snapping into place. Make sure it's all snapped in all the way around. Because there's these uh, these tabs here, 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 all around it that grab on to that bottom cover. So it's gotta be all snapped into place. You can check all the way around. You can see what I mean. I don't like to do this until everything's up and running. Um, but I'm just showing you how it works. And then we screw everything in. We got lots of screws to put in here. Right? And there's about, uh, about a dozen of these that hold into place. And when you're done, you can put your battery in. And this battery actually has two screws as well. And they go here and here. But I'm going to leave the rest of the screws out for now, just in case there's any issues with the laptop. Because uh, I'm going to go and install a new OS to it now. And we'll take a look when it's done. Okay, so it took about uh, 12 minutes. I created a boot USB drive using Rufus and uh, copied over the Ubuntu version 17 ISO to this and uh, plugged that in, installed it onto this system, and all told took about 10, 12 minutes. So it looks like it's installed good. And you can see it here running Firefox and it's much more efficient, runs a lot better than Windows 10 was. And the Windows 10 that I had running on this was actually, uh, that was a fresh install that I had done on this. And I did it on both laptops at the same time just to see the difference between the SSD that I upgraded on the one and the original drive on this one. So Windows 10 was just atrociously slow on this device, which is a core i5 with six gigabytes of RAM. Uh, DDR3, but you can see here Linux runs and it also runs well. So that install is complete and I just wanted to kind of wrap up everything because uh, it was doing a lot inside this laptop. It's all put back together now though and running good with Linux. And so that's about it for this video.